Furniture tells us a lot about a period, people or place. It's solid, so it can often be the only tangible artefact left. It often bears the impression of human activity through use and they do tell stories. For example, you can see the botanical cabinet belonging to Mary Eleanor Bowes at Bowes Museum in Barnard Castle, and her pursuit of her botanical studies is likely one of the things that carried her through her turbulent personal life. Items of furniture also carry their own traditions through the ways in which we use the things that we inherit. Just look at BBC's The Repair Shop and the quest to repair treasured family heirlooms, which often includes furniture such as nursing chairs, chests and even a miniature bar. How many people did sit in that chair before you? And quilts that cause use of furnishings carry so much energy from one generation to the next. But what about the folklore of furniture? In a more general sense, if a young child marks any furniture, the child will soon die, since the markers believed to be them marking their way out of the world. And individual items of furniture, such as beds, chairs and tables, also carry their own superstitions and rights. Let's explore them in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. Welcome to 2023. As this episode goes out, it is the 7th of January. And it's actually quite hard to believe that Fabulous Folklore itself turns four next week. That's right, I first press published on the 12th of January 2019 and the very first episode was The Hand of Glory. And it does seem like I've come quite a distance since then. I've got episodes I can't even remember doing. So I did think that was worth noting. So if you would like to raise a cup or a glass of whatever you're holding right at this minute and wish Fabulous Folklore a happy birthday, you're more than welcome to do that. The other update I briefly wanted to do before we get started is if you're going to be in London on April the 11th, then I'm actually teaching a live in-person class at the Miskatonic Institute and it's called Water Water Everywhere because we're looking at water folklore in terms of British folklore. So we'll be looking at things like selkies and kelpies, things like that, but then also other water-based traditions. We'll be having a look at things like Celtic water deities, because obviously there's deities like Coventina up near me, and we'll be looking at all those kind of things as well. And I have put the link in the show notes if you want to book tickets for that, which has a much longer bio about what we're going to be covering. I didn't want to take up too much time here. And also you can book tickets as well. So it would be marvellous to meet any of you in person if you are available on April the 11th. I don't think there's an online version as well. I'll have to double check about that. But for now, as I say, I do know that it is going to be live and in person. So it would be quite nice to see if that's possible. But anyway, we are starting off with January's theme. And because I've had quite a lot of requests from listeners that don't always necessarily hang together as a whole month theme, I thought what I would do for this first month of 2023 is pick out some of the ones that really caught my eye and that I can actually do episodes on because unfortunately some of the requests that I get I've either already done them or they're just not doable and it's just simply because there isn't any folklore about that particular thing. Because I'm doing this slightly more eclectic approach one of the requests was folklore and furnishings and I thought oh my god where am I going to start but once I got started there's actually a lot more than I expected. So we're going to start off with the folklore of tables. Now when I first started researching this article the thing that tables really sort of said to me was seances because obviously on one hand you've got people sat around tables they're fiercely holding hands and they're trying to help maintain the energy of the seance so that the daily departed can pass on their message and then on the other hand you've got people cajoling the spirits to move household items often small tables as part of the table turning phenomenon now personally I've always found people yelling at the dead and daring them to move things just to prove that they're there is actually quite rude because they're dead they're not performing monkeys but there we go. That is how obviously some people do like to run their investigations. Now, table turning was actually disproved by Michael Faraday in 1853, but it is still a staple part of many paranormal investigations because it's an easy way to make things look like they're happening. Now, both of these uses of tables 
in the seance room derive in part from the creation of spiritualism in 1848 by the Fox sisters in New York and the use of tables to communicate with the dead had actually already reached the UK by the early 1850s. But it does just go to show how something as humble as a table can become an important element within ghost stories as a site through which messages can be conveyed. So, for example, some people continue to lay an extra place at the table after a death, although some people only do so for a month while the spirit of the daily departed is still nearby. And maybe it's more than just messages that gets passed on through tables. Look at the table in the audit room at Chetham School in Manchester, which bears a burn mark. Now, this is said to have been made by one of the devil's hooves after Dr John Dee himself conjured him up for his advice. Now, no one knows what the advice was that old Nick passed on, if indeed he did pass on any advice, but he apparently left the burn mark behind. Is the legend true? I don't know, but it certainly makes a good story. And this tangibility of something like a burn mark in a table helps to lend the legend some kind of credence. Now, tables are also part of a somewhat strange fixation with marriage in folklore, because if you're an unmarried woman, you should take care not to sit on a table, otherwise you'll never marry. Although this does actually contradict other folklore that says a single person sitting on the edge of a table means that they want to marry. So I think in some ways you can possibly take that one with a pinch of salt. But I would say beware the tablecloth because you had to be careful when you were folding the tablecloth and some of these superstitions also apply to sheets. But if you folded a tablecloth and doubled up the middle in a particular way, you end up with an octagonal crease and that can look like a coffin, which was believed to be an omen of death. You can figure out why. But finding a diamond in the folds of an unfolded sheet also meant that someone would apparently die in the bed that it was used on. It was also considered unlucky to play cards at a table with no tablecloth. So just bear that one in mind. Now you can't talk about tables without talking about chairs. And chairs are perhaps more associated with tales of ghosts and actual activity because they're often found overturned after moments of spectral activity. And indeed, if you remember the Grey Lady Ghosts episode, one of the instances with the Grey Lady of the Theatre Royal was apparently a workman had heard some noises in the box above him. And when he went up, all the chairs had been overturned and obviously that was not for him. And in horror films, armchairs can be haunted by previous occupants of the beleaguered home, particularly if the chair was a favourite resting spot or if the person actually passed away there. And I obviously can't resist a Ghostbusters reference. I mean, I can, but I'm just not going to try. And if you just look at the armchair that captures Dana in the first film and then deposits her in the realm of Zool. Also, remember that it's a chair in which the ghost of Lord Combermere is said to be captured in the famous photo, and this was a picture that was taken at the time of his funeral, where a figure is materialising in the chair, and most people who've seen it do recognise it as being Lord Combermere. I should point out that at the time the photo was taken, I said it was during a funeral, it was Lord Combermere's funeral. So it is taken to be an image that's been captured of him. Now, there is also a famous haunted chair connected with Thomas Busby, and I'm going to be exploring that separately in this month's exclusive article, which is only available to Patreon supporters, but but at all levels, so you can support for as little as 75p a month. But superstitions also cling to certain types of chairs, particularly rocking chairs. And I mean, let's be honest, there's something ever so slightly creepy about rocking chairs to start with, although we may only think that because they get really overused in horror films. Now, it is considered bad luck to play cards while sitting in a rocking chair, but you also need to watch out for unoccupied rocking chairs that move of their own accord. One superstition claims that this means a death is imminent in the family, while another superstition says it's because a spirit of a family member has actually returned to claim the next to die. If you do end up playing cards in a regular chair and you're losing, then stand up and turn your chair around three times and this is believed to change your luck. And you can also just twist the chair on one leg four times, which is also believed to turn your luck. Be careful that you don't just turn your chair at random though, because in some parts of the country it brings bad luck to turn a chair around twice or more. So it only seems to have any luck involved if it's when you're playing cards. Sitting beside an empty chair brings bad luck. But if a person is sitting at a table and then stands up and knocks over their chair, it meant that whatever they'd said had been a lie. So bear that one in mind. And there's also a really specific one about nurses who knock over chairs mean that new patients are on the way to their ward. 
And indeed, most people who work in offices will probably have known that really irritating phenomenon where a female member of staff sits down and it turns out that the seat was that of a woman who either is pregnant or has just given birth. And then everyone around them is like, oh, you're going to be next. I mean, I find that quite crass and it does have the potential to be quite insensitive because nobody knows the feelings of the person who sat down around the idea of being pregnant. But Jacqueline Simpson and Steve Rowe do note that this is a relatively recent phenomenon and it doesn't seem to appear in any of the older superstitions. So this one's probably a newer version of older folklore. And we will come back to this when we look at cradles as well. You should also avoid passing a chair over a table or a row will break out. And if you're having a catch up with a friend and you get up from the table, don't push your chair back under or you won't come back down to sit or you won't come back to sit down there. Also, try not to sit down in a seat as soon as it becomes available or the second person to sit will follow the first one who stood up to the grave. And this last superstition is the one that gives rise to the phrase, would you jump in my grave as fast when someone slides into your seat as soon as you stand up. And if you've ever used the London Underground, you'll be very familiar with that particular phenomenon. We're going to move on from chairs to beds here and I'm sorry if I feel like I'm going really fast it's just there's so much content to include for this one. I honestly didn't think there was going to be that many superstitions associated with furniture but apparently I was wrong. But beds are probably the most common which I think is really hardly surprising because people are obviously at their most vulnerable when they're in the bedrooms because this is obviously the place where we're asleep, we're dreaming, we're not really conscious necessarily. So we do find quite a lot of stuff around apotropaic items around the bed, which obviously I've covered before. But this would include things like horseshoes hung at the foot of the bed to ward off danger. People leaving things like Bibles hidden at the head of the bed or in the roof space or under their pillow, things like that. And people might put a branch of rowan either in or near the bed, which would apparently potentially stop you from being hag ridden. Now, it's also considered bad luck to sit on a sick patient's bed or you'd be the next one in bed. And I know in some hospitals, obviously, they prefer you to sit in the chairs provided rather than on your loved one's bed. And I think that this particular superstition is probably rooted in hygiene practice because if you've just come in from outside, who knows what germs you're carrying? Do you really want to transfer them onto the bed of a sick person? So I think that one probably has some kind of realism at the heart of it. But making the bed even has folklore attached to it. And in Scotland, some people believed it was actually unlucky to leave a bed half made. So if you basically stopped in the middle of making a bed, it was going to cause problems because any interruption during the making process would bring insomnia to the bed's usual occupant. If you sneezed while making a bed, you were supposed to take some of the straw out of the mattress and throw it in the fire so as not to disturb the sleep of its usual occupant. Obviously, it shows how old that particular superstition is if a mattress has straw in it. But three people should never make the same bed at the same time or there would be a death in the house within a year. You shouldn't turn your mattress on a Sunday or it'll bring bad dreams to the bed's occupant for the following week. And other people thought that it was actually bad luck to do so or you would lose your partner. And this one particularly applied to young women with their sweethearts. And other people said that you shouldn't turn a mattress on Friday or you would turn the luck. And I've actually heard my mother say that one before, which is quite interesting. You should also try to avoid changing your sheets on a Friday or the devil would control your dreams for the following week. And if you enjoy quilting, women who finish a patchwork quilt without needing any help would never marry. And you also had to make sure that you actually finished your quilts because an unfinished bedspread meant that no one in the house would marry. But even the placement of the bed is important. And Jacqueline Simpson and Steve Rowe note that you shouldn't sleep with the foot of the bed facing the door. And that's because coffins were carried out of the house feet first, so sleeping in the same direction was thought to be tempting fate. You should also align your bed with the direction of the floorboards, because putting the bed across them would stop you from sleeping. But that said, you also needed to be careful where any floor beams were in relation to the bed. And in 1846, a sick person in Devon really seemed to be prolonging their death more than the relatives could stand to see. And they realised that there was actually a beam concealed in the floor above, so they moved the bed and the man finally passed away. And other stories echoed this belief that beams or planks going across the bed would stop a person from dying. Incidentally, there is also some talk about the fact that if somebody is lying on a pillow that is stuffed with feathers from either a dove or a pigeon, the person couldn't die either. So there's a lot of strange folklore around which way around people would be. Because if you think about it in previous centuries, people basically died in bed at home. They didn't die away somewhere else in hospitals. So obviously people would be trying to control people's safety and also ensure a good death as possible where they could. 
Obviously, there's also the phrase about getting out of the wrong side of the bed, and it was believed to be bad luck to put your left foot on the floor first when you were getting up, so you should ideally position the bed so that you get out of the right-hand side first. Obviously, that doesn't help if there's two of you, and the folklore doesn't really explain how you would get around that, but as long as you put your right foot down first, I think you should basically be fine. And obviously we can't really talk about beds without the widespread belief that there's something living under them and how many of us even now hate putting our feet out of bed during the night for fear that something might grab our ankle. I think some of this stuff tends to be related to the earlier folklore around house spirits and things like that but I didn't really want to go into that too much because this episode was already getting too long so if you want a separate episode on monsters under the bed then please do let me know. And I thought it was an interesting leap to go from beds to cradles because cradles are essentially just miniature beds for babies. And cradles obviously don't escape from folklore because there's a need to protect their really vulnerable occupant. And it was considered particularly unlucky to make a cradle from elder because elder trees were believed to play host to a dryad that would haunt whoever cut down the tree. So making a cradle from elder meant that the child would never find any peace. And indeed, in one story from 1889, a family actually noticed that their baby was very ill. A relative realised that one of the cradle's rockers was actually made from elder, and when they removed it, the baby bounced back to full health. And even buying a cradle could prove difficult, because parents strove not to buy one until the child was born, because bringing a new cradle into the house before the birth was deemed to be a bad omen. And finally, rocking an empty cradle was actually believed to be an omen, but this time of a new occupant, so a little bit more positive than some of the other omens we've covered so far. But a lot of the law seems to revolve around existing parents doing everything that they could to prevent anyone rocking the cradle and thus bringing a new baby within the year. And I think this is the piece of folklore that has given rise to that idea of, you know, if you sit in the seat of someone who's just had a baby, you'll be the next one. So it's like a weird combination of catching the bouquet at a wedding and rocking an empty cradle. They seem to have both combined and become a weird piece of office folklore. And finally, we're going to have a look at pictures because these fall under the heading of furnishings and there is a little bit of folklore about them and their Romans, and I thought it was worth including it here, because when you talk about furniture and furnishings, I do think your decor becomes part of it. But in the 17th century, people believed that it meant bad luck was coming if their portrait fell to the floor, and there was this idea that some mystical force had broken the string to knock it from the wall, and there's all these kind of stories about things like somebody's painting falling from the wall, and then people going, oh no, and then trying to find out if the person it was of is okay, because there was this belief And this actually remained by the 19th century, no doubt because the portrait was considered the double of the person in it, so any damage to the portrait could, in theory, refer to damage to the person. So as a result, a picture falling on a wedding day portends bad luck, and a family portrait falling means death is coming to the family. Now, surprisingly, the belief actually remained even into the late 20th century, with noted author Catherine Cookson even subscribing to the belief. And a woman in 1986 reported that she'd, and I quote, never known a picture fall without someone in the family dying soon after, end quote. You also needed to be careful where you actually hung your pictures because it was considered bad luck to hang them over a doorway or a bedhead. And I can't help thinking that quite a lot of that was probably due to a fear of them falling and thus landing on someone. So ultimately, what do we make of the folklore of furniture? Well, like I said earlier, furniture can be highly personal. And after the Great Exhibition in 1851, people took a lot more interest about what their design choices said about them. And this greater emphasis on furniture and also how it fits into our sense of identity as well could explain why many of the superstitions involving furniture only date to the 19th century onwards. Because it's sort of at this point that for ordinary people, furniture then becomes a way of them expressing themselves and not just simply something practical around the house. But furniture does also bear the scars of its interactions with humans. Every scuff, scrape and replacement part tells a story about its past. And what we store in furniture turns caskets, chests and wardrobes into a microcosm of a person. These items taken together paint a picture of their owner. So it's hardly surprising that these items can appear in ghost stories. And for a brief period from the 1850s to early 1860s, in Britain at least, haunted objects were considered proof that ghosts existed. And of course, there's also how we actually interact with furniture. And many of the superstitions involve omens or a tenuous belief in the ability to control your fate through your interactions with inanimate objects. And I think this is something that we do need to bear in mind, that if you feel like you can prevent a death occurring by making the bed the correct way, sitting up or 
sitting down or getting up the right way from a chair or folding sheets properly, then it gives you some sense of control over what is otherwise out of your hands. And I think a lot of folklore kind of falls into that kind of category, as we saw in the Welsh Death Omens episode just between Christmas and New Year. So that's basically the folklore of furniture and furnishings and I'd love to know if you've got any sayings or traditions associated with the furniture in your house. Are there any cool stories associated with anything that you'd like to share? If so, please feel free to leave a comment on the blog post that is attached to this episode. The blog, the link is in the show notes below. If you're listening to this on YouTube, obviously feel free to just whack a comment below as well. That's fine. Or you can always tweet me, as always, on Twitter because Twitter appears to still be working. Or you can also message me on Instagram. I'm really quite easy to get hold of, basically. And I'm on pretty much every platform as IC Sedgwick. And that's Sedgwick with one E. But anyway, thank you very much for listening to this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed that. We are looking at shapeshifters next week. So that is quite a broad category and I haven't quite decided which way I'm going to tackle it. But that is what we're going to be looking at. So I hope you enjoy it. And yeah, it's great to be back. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.